Welcome everyone. February 10th, 2022. We are Cutting Edge Lectures in Science from McGill University in Montreal, Canada. McGill is situated on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe Nations. McGill has long recognized and respected and honored these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and the waters where we live, where we work, where we play, where we exchange information, where we share with each other. I'm reminded of the treaty, One Dish, One Spoon, forged by the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississauga. It was originally a, a treaty of friendship between nations to share the resources on the land. One dish, one spoon. No extra helpings. Everyone's in it together, coping as best they can, helping each other, looking out for each other. I'm reminded of that today. Our speaker for this evening will be introduced by the student ambassadors, Isabel Smith and Heather Rogers. Welcome all. We are so pleased to be here with Dr. Stephanie Blaine Morias. Stephanie is an assistant professor at the School of Physical and Occupational Therapy, where she runs the Biosignal Interaction and Personhood Technology Lab and uses physiological signals to try to enhance the personhood of people who are not communicative. She is here today to present her talk on Detecting Consciousness in the Absence of Responsiveness. Stephanie received her education first at the University of Toronto, where she completed a Bachelor of Applied Science in Engineering Science with a specialization in Biomedical Engineering. While she was there, she also worked for the first time with engineering in a rehabilitation setting. This inspired her to pursue a joint PhD in Biomedical Engineering and Rehabilitation Sciences at the University of Toronto. She has done two postdocs, one where she looked at brain-computer interfaces, and a second in anesthesiology, exploring the question of consciousness. Without further ado, Stephanie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bell and Heather, for the introduction, and thank you to Ingrid and the Red Path Museum for the opportunity to share my work here. It's an honor to be part of this, this amazing lecture series. So I'm an engineer by training. Uh, I did my PhD at a Children's Rehabilitation Hospital uh, in Toronto, where I worked with kids who were um, severe and multiple disabilities. Many of them were tube fed, relied on a ventilator in order to breathe and had minimal to no ability to interact with their environment. As an engineer, I focused on building communication technologies uh, to help them interact with the world, but their existence opened up some more uh, existential questions. Were these individuals who are unresponsive, were they conscious? What does that mean? What does it mean in order to be conscious? We've been pondering this question for since the beginning of you know, being able to think, uh, but the science of consciousness, the study of consciousness is actually quite a young field. And I'd like to use the, the 200 years of McGill's existence as a time frame to benchmark just how young this field of consciousness science is. So in the, um, in the late 19th century, William James, uh, who is a, a physician, uh, considered consciousness one of the pinnacles of science. And at this point, philosophy and phenomenology were considered grounds for science because you needed a self in order to observe the world. Moving into the 20th century, uh, there was more of a marginalization towards the science of consciousness because of the two dominant models of the mind at that time. The first was behaviorism, which comes from the field of psychology. And in behaviorism, you consider environmental inputs and behavioral outputs, and the black box that connects them uh, is just not in the domain of science. So subjective experience was just off the table scientifically. The other model of the mind that dominated in the early 1900s was psychoanalysis um, led by Sigmund Freud. And it's not that consciousness was not on the table, it was just not interesting in comparison to the dynamics of the unconscious, which drove human behavior. Uh, Sigmund Freud said that consciousness was nearly the tip of the iceberg. 
And because of these two dominant models of the mind, the scientific study of consciousness was just not even considered until almost the 1980s, where models of consciousness started showing up in psychology. So Bernard Bars, for example, in the 1980s came up with a global workspace theory of consciousness. And then at that time, a number of prominent scientists and intellectuals all turned their attention to consciousness simultaneously. So after winning, winning the Nobel Prize for his discoveries in DNA, Francis Crick turned his attention to consciousness, mentored a scientist named Christoph Koch, who is still in the field today. Francis Crick said, it's remarkable that most of the work in both cognitive science and the neurosciences makes no reference to consciousness or awareness. Simultaneously, Gerald Edelman, after winning his Nobel Prize for his work in immunoglobulin, turned his attention to consciousness as well and mentored a young scientist named Giulio Tononi, who again is, a, is still in the field of consciousness science today. And then uh, along another line of investigation, Sir Roger Penrose, who won the 2020 Nobel Prize, also uh, thought of consciousness. So there was this coalescence of forces um, and the discussion of consciousness was opened. It was still a, a small fringe field, but uh, and you couldn't call yourself a, a consciousness scientist if you were on tenure track, but these, uh, these intellectuals gave uh, the field, uh, it opened up the field of the science of consciousness. And this um, continued through the 1990s. Uh, you saw the first scientific consciousness conference in Tucson, Arizona in the 1990s. And this uh, also this decade also had uh, the emergence of the first journals, the peer reviewed journals associated with consciousness. So it really is a field that is only about 30 or 40 years old. And if you compare it to the length of the life of McGill, Fields such as physics, biology, you realize just how new this field is. It's such an exciting time to be involved in this sort of research. Um, since the field is new, there still are a number of things that the field is struggling with. And one of them is defining the terms. What does it mean when we talk about consciousness? What is the definition of consciousness? We haven't come up with, an, uh, with, the field hasn't come up with a, a definition that we all agree on yet. Many people have tried. So one of the earliest attempts was Thomas Nagel's um, uh, written work, what, it's, what's, what is it like to be a bat, uh, published in the 1970s. And he was trying to describe what it's like to have a subjective experience, the sense of interiority, this, this sense of experience. Uh, and he, he said in this paper, there is, so it, there is something that it is like to be that organism. It's an experience. There is something that it is like. And we come, we use this definition still to this day. Other scientists in the field have defined consciousness by its absence. So Giulio Tononi uh, has defined consciousness as what abandons us every night when we fall into a dreamless sleep. Neither of these definitions exactly uh, hits the mark, but we, we're coming close. Scientists haven't agreed exactly what it is that we're measuring, but there actually is a little bit more agreement around how to measure it, even if we don't necessarily agree on precisely what it is that we're measuring. So in uh, the one of the prominent journals in the field of consciousness science is the Neuroscience of Consciousness. And in its inaugural, the editors wrote, the main strategy in consciousness science lies in con connecting objective third person data about the brain and behavior with subjective first person data about the properties of conscious experience, including whether they're present at all. Within this broad multidisciplinary scope, there's an increasing focus on the brain as the primary biological substance for awareness. So the strategy of consciousness science is to look at brain activity associated with experience. And so most of consciousness science looks at the brain using tools such as functional magnetic resonance imaging, um, magnetoencephalography, and electroencephalography. We look at um, how to, uh, we, we look at, use these tools to look at brain activity uh, while we modulate different properties of our experience. So there's uh, several different strategies that we use to probe human consciousness. One of them is uh, we manipulating the contents of our consciousness, what we are aware of. 
a, a, a traditional way of doing this is looking at subliminal processing, looking at auditory visual stimuli uh, that we perceive or don't perceive, and then contrasting the brain activity between the stimuli that is and is not perceived. Uh, more recently, there's been a lot of interest and popularity in using psychedelics to modulate the contents of consciousness and to compare and contrast the, the brain activity of individuals on and off psychedelics. Another strategy for studying consciousness is by manipulating the levels of consciousness. When we talk about le levels of consciousness, we typically look at a two-dimensional uh, plane defined by uh, wakefulness and awareness. Uh, and we contrast the brain activity of someone in conscious wakefulness, which is at the top right quadrant of, of um, this dimensional space, with other altered states of consciousness. So for example, we look at the brain activity of someone under general anesthesia, and we look at the brain activity of individuals in various states of sleep. In my research, I use uh, neither of these states of consciousness predominantly. My path into the study of consciousness is by examining pathologically altered states of consciousness. So specifically, I would look at um, individuals in disorders of consciousness here represented by the blue circles. You have individuals who have high levels of wakefulness, their eyes are open, uh, they, are, they have sleep-wake cycles, they're able to yawn, tear, but they have minimal to no levels of awareness of themselves or of their environment. Individuals who have no levels of awareness who are unconscious are in what we call a vegetative state or more recently unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. And individuals who are have minimal levels of awareness, fluctuating levels of awareness, inconsistent levels of, of awareness are in what we call a, a minimally conscious state. So these individuals are quite similar to the, the children I described at the beginning of this talk who are unable to move, unable to speak. And the big question when we encounter these individuals is, how do we know whether they're conscious or not? How can we tell whether they're having any sort of subjective experience? How can we tell whether they're aware of themselves, aware of their parents, aware of the things that are happening in their environment? Are they in pain? What are they feeling? This is not an easy question to answer. So I'll give you an example of one of the um, sort of, uh, one of the clinical cases that uh, I've worked with in my research. Uh, this is a, a 29, the, this is a CT scan of a 29 year old male who was riding a motorcycle down the 401 in Toronto and uh, collided head on with a truck. He was admitted into the intensive care unit, mechanically ventilated. His EEG report showed very poor prognosis. His CT scan on the 43rd day after his admission to the hospital was also very poor. When we assessed him behaviorally, when we asked him to respond to the commands, when we looked at whether his pupils dilated or not, when we looked at whether he withdrew in response to pain, he scored four on the Glasgow Coma Scale and four on the Coma Recovery Scale Revised, which means that he was, uh, by these scales, in a vegetative state, in unresponsive wakefulness syndrome, which by definition means that he is unconscious. However, when his wife came into the room and interacted with him, she reported that sometimes he would follow her around with his eyes. Sometimes she could feel him squeeze his hand, squeeze her hand in response to commands. She had evidence in that that he was responsive. And the major question is: Is this patient conscious or not? So there are limitations to these behavioral assessments of conscious awareness in unresponsive individuals like the one I just presented to you. So we know that just because someone is unresponsive does not mean that they are unconscious. There are examples from many different fields, for example, intraoperative awareness when someone is paralyzed and unable to move or speak but becomes aware during a surgery. We know from reports from people who have recovered from comas that just because they were responsive does not mean that they were unconscious. However, right now, our way of detecting consciousness is linked to a patient's ability to respond or react to a stimulus in the command. And if you are, for example, if you're paralyzed because you're under surgery, or if you have systemic trauma because of an, of an accident and you're unable to activate your motor system in order to respond to commands, you could be perceived as unconscious, even though you're just unresponsive. 
In 2006, one of my colleagues, Adrian Owen, uh, showed that we can take individuals who are unconscious and by putting them into an fMRI, something that images your brain, uh, and asking people to imagine, for example, imagine playing tennis or imagine navigating your house, you could detect the ability for people to respond to commands just by looking at their brain activity. So once you ask someone to imagine playing tennis, for example, you may see their motor cortex light up if they are command following. However, the fMRI is a giant magnet and many individuals who are in a disorder of consciousness have a lot of contraindications for this technology. So while it works for a subset of this population, it really isn't broadly applicable. So this is where my lab enters the enters the um, the science of consciousness field. Uh, we wanted to look at this problem and try to figure out if there was a way to use tools such as anesthesia to provide some sort of insight into whether these individuals were conscious or not. So Heather mentioned that I did my uh, second postdoc in anesthesiology. This was because anesthesiologists are trained to control an individual's consciousness. You pay them lots of money to be able to turn your consciousness off and then to be able to bring your consciousness back. And so we could, in a very titrated fashion, um, uh, turn off an individual's level of consciousness and gradually bring it back and look at what was happening in the brain in response to this change in anesthetic level. One of the things that I need you to uh, understand when we were, when we're uh, looking at the next few slides has to do with the way that we process our EEG. So we have, we record high density EEG with 128 electrodes placed onto an individual's head and for each electrode, we can calculate what we call the directed functional connectivity relationship between these electrodes. We have on the screen here, we have two waveforms, a black and a blue waveform. And if you look at the, the phase of each of these waves, we can see that the blue wave is phase leading the black wave. So the blue, the blue is, um, we say that it is, is phase leading and the black is phase lagging. If we calculate this across all 128 electrodes on an individual's head, we get a graph that looks like this. This is a, um, a map, a heat map of the phase lead leg relationships across 128 electrodes. Red means that the electrodes are phase leading, blue means that the electrodes are phase lagging. And I wanna draw your attention to the colors inside these, these black boxes, which is the connection between the frontal and the parietal areas of your brain. What I want you to notice is that individuals who are conscious have a phase uh, lead relationship in the front of the brain and a phase lag relationship at the front of uh, the back of the brain. The information is heading towards the back of the brain predominantly. And in individuals who are unconscious, that relationship is neutralized. You can see it right here. This is someone who is anesthetized with ketamine. Um, at the baseline state, there's a, a feedback dominant connectivity and under ketamine induced anesthesia, it's, it's um, neutralized. The other um, tool that I would like to introduce you to in order to characterize brain responses is uh, some basic graph theory. So we can take the EEG and create a network from it by treating each of the electrodes as nodes and the strength of the connectivity between each of the electrodes as edges. If we take the strongest edges and set those uh, to be connected, we create a graph and we can characterize the graph using graph theory properties. What we're interested in is the hubs of this graph, where most of these nodes connect to. Hubs have high degree, they have high levels of connectivity to other areas of the graph, and they also act as conduits between different modules of the graph. You're looking here at a bird's eye view of a, a brain, and we're again looking at a heat map, but this time the red indicates where there are high degree nodes, so where the hubs of the brain network are. And you'll see that in the conscious individuals, the hubs are located at the back of the brain, and in the unconscious individuals, the hubs move to the front of the brain. So can we take this information, can we take this insight from anesthetic induced unconsciousness and use it to somehow determine the level of consciousness of a patient who is unresponsive? This is what we set out to do. This is a work that is con been, has been conducted by um, four of my incredible postdoc and graduate students. Um, I'd like to especially draw attention to Catherine Duclos, who's the one on the top, who is the lead author of this study. 
We wanted to use anesthesia as a novel tool for diagnosis and prognosis in this population. We recorded 128 channel EEG in 12 patients with disorders of consciousness. And we looked at their EEG before they were exposed to anesthesia, during their exposure to anesthesia and after their exposure to anesthesia. And our hypothesis was if these individuals were truly conscious, we would see changes in the brain um, feed forward feedback patterns and the hub location that mirrored loss of consciousness. But if these individuals were unconscious to begin with, then we wouldn't see these patterns. So we looked at, um, like I said, the network hubs and the directed phase like index across these three states. What we found was that uh, we followed these patients for, for three months and looked at whether they recovered consciousness or not. Four of them did recover consciousness, eight of them did not. And what we found with the, was that those who did recover consciousness showed the canonical switch from feedback dominant connectivity to either neutral or feed forward dominant connectivity if they recovered. And those who did not recover either showed no reconfiguration or just pathological patterns of um, feedback dominant connectivity. If you looked at their hub locations, we found again, the patients, all of the patients that recovered showed this anteriorization of network hubs and those who didn't recover either showed no um, reconfiguration of their brain work network or pathological patterns of, of reconfiguration. So we took all of this information and synthesized it into an index, which we called the Adaptive Reconfiguration Index. And we were able to predict with 100% accuracy whether an individual would recover consciousness within 90 days based on how well their brains were able to reconfigure when we gave it this and them anesthesia. So this is very, this is very exciting. These are preliminary results, but this is very exciting. And it gives us a sense that uh, the, the ability for the brain to respond to external perturbations such as anesthesia is critical for its ability to sustain consciousness. We have some insight into what the brain needs in order to respond to consciousness. Uh, in order to in order to have the capacity for consciousness. So this is a, a potentially very useful clinical tool. However, it only works in this one moment when we take the EEG and we give the, uh, give the individual anesthesia. It is not something that is useful on a day-to-day -day basis. And what we were hearing from the caregivers of patients who are unresponsive was that, yes, this might be useful for treatment decisions, but how can they have access to this sort of information in order to get a sense of the moment-by-moment -moment changes in an individual's subjective experience? How can we tell what they're feeling on a day-to-day -day basis, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, um, if they are unable to respond to us? So my lab is also working on technologies in order to answer this exact question. Um, we have uh, individual, actually I wanted to, before I come to that, I wanted to come back to this individual. I, I wanted to circle back to him. Um, this individual was one of the, the people, one of the four who did recover consciousness. Uh, and and is now living at home with his wife and has recovered from from this incredible trauma, so it just shows the the potential for this to be used clinically. But I wanted to come back now to these technologies that we can use potentially to give caregivers on a day to day level insight into an individual's fluctuating level of consciousness. One of the technologies that we're developing is something called resonance. We take the high density EEG. So you see that on the picture on the left, that's one of my grad students wearing a high density EEG system. We extract features of the EEG that are associated with conscious awareness and we turn them into music. So we can hear the symphony of the brain. We can hear the orchestration of all of these EEG features associated with consciousness. Then as part of this assemblage, we invite therapeutic clowns to come and interact with the patient. Therapeutic clowns are trained artists, highly trained artists who are very used to working in a healthcare setting. They improvise and part of their skill set is to be able to develop connections with patients regardless of their level of responsiveness. They're used to looking for very subtle cues and developing interpersonal relationships based on um, whatever they're getting from the patient. So, we have the clowns interacting with the real time generated brain music of these unresponsive individuals. And I'll just give you a really quick peek uh, as to what this could look and sound like. So 
is one of the technologies that our lab is working on. Another along a similar vein is something called biomusic. And this technology moves away from the brain and into the body. What you're looking at here is a, a sensor that is uh, uh, being worn by a little boy with complex disabilities. And it's recording signals of his autonomic nervous system. So these are signals that are that are affected by an individual's emotions. So specifically, it's recording electrodermal activity, skin temperature, and uh, blood volume pulse, where we can extract heart rate. We, uh, these signals are sent to a smartphone and an app, by a music app, where they are processed and again converted into musical output. Uh, and caregivers are able to hear the music, the real-time music that's, that's being generated by uh, the individual who's wearing it. For those of you who are watching who are in Montreal and who are interested in what your biomusic might sound like, you can head on down to the Montreal Science Centre, which is down at the Old Port. There, there's an exhibit called Mes Émotions sont à fleur de peau, and here we you can listen to your biomusic. What happens is you put your, you go into this, this booth, you put your hand on top of a physiological sensor and we present to you videos that are meant to induce particular emotions. Um, we ask you to rate how you're feeling and then we play the videos back to you with your bio music overlaid. So you can figure out how your body sounds when you're watching scary videos. And uh, my lab is collecting all of this data for a big machine learning database project. So you'll help, be helping out me and my science as well. But coming back to biomusic and uh, the, the application of this technology to unresponsive individuals, we ran a pilot study with three children in complex continuing care and asked these individuals to wear biomusic while caregivers were interacting with them. We wanted to see if listening to somebody's uh, body music would have an effect on their interactions. We noticed that caregivers noticed changes in biomusic in response to their actions. They would do something and the biomusic would change and the caregivers would, would remark, oh, I hear a change in the music. We noticed that when the caregivers noticed changes in the biomusic, it had an effect on their interactions. One of the caregivers, when we interviewed them after said, it had a big role on myself, knowing how to deal with him. It calms me down. Instead of being so silent, something is right there. We also noticed that biomusic changed how caregivers perceived non-communicative patients. So here's two quotes from two of the participants in our study. This is a quote from um, a father of a 13-year-old boy who was in an accident. He said, the sound keeps on. It feels like my son still exists. And this is a quote from a, a, a nurse who is, who is the um, was permanent, uh, well, one of, the, one of the, the, the major caregivers of um, an older girl who has been living in this long-term care facility for a while. Um, she's been taking care of her for 10 years. And when she listened to this girl's bio music, she said, it was almost like she was trying to relate to you through her music to us. But I'm thinking that was unique. Like we sometimes we forget as caregivers that, you know, we just kind of not look at the person and just do what we have to do. This makes us step back and actually think about, okay, so this is a person. She may be dreaming. She may be having some sort of thought. She's not able to verbalize, but there are other ways she could probably give back to us. And I find this a very powerful quote, particularly, okay, so this is a person. And this brings me to the last pillar of my research program. We have found that when an individual's consciousness, level of consciousness is in question, one of the, one of the consequences of this is that an individual is at risk of loss of personhood. We've tried buying music on many different populations, children in palliative care, children in complex continuing care, adults with advanced dementia, individuals with um, severe autism. And across the board, when we found that when individuals lack the ability to interact with other people, they're at risk of loss of personhood. By this, um, when I talk about personhood, I really like this definition by Tom Kitwood, 
uh, from Dementia Reconsidered, he says that personhood is a standing or a status that's bestowed upon one human, human being by others in the context of relationship and social being. And we know that loss of personhood occurs when one is perceived as not being interactionally available. So if we don't have a sense of their co-presence, in other words, if we don't know if they're conscious or not, and if we don't have a sense of reciprocity, if we do something and we're not sure whether they're responding or not, they are at risk of loss of personhood. So the last pillar that my research program is built on is to be able to augment the personhood of individuals who are behaviorally unresponsive. Uh, unresponsive. Some of this happens through the technologies that we built, but I'm also partnering with individuals who are exploring other means of doing this. And I'd like to highlight the work of my postdoc, Nyla Coleman, who is using the arts, uh, circus, theater, as an arts-based knowledge translation tool to enhance the personhood of individuals with neurodegenerative conditions. She's put together two beautiful performances, she, which she co-created with individuals who are living with Parkinson's and with dementia, along with scientists who study these neurodegenerative conditions, and with artists, circus performers, musicians, dancers, um, and they created two performances, which are called Peace of Mind. I've put the YouTube links up on this slide, but if you go onto YouTube and just type in Peace of Mind Parkinson's or Peace of Mind Dementia, you'll find them as well. And we find that the arts are an extraordinary tool to be able to convey the what it's like. Like we said at the very beginning, the, the conscious experience, the what it is like to be in a certain situation, the arts are an incredibly powerful tool to be able to communicate this between individuals. And in doing so, enhancing the personhood of individuals who are un otherwise unable to communicate this state for themselves. So uh, just in closing, um, I'd like to just take a, a quick moment to just reflect on the ground that we've covered in looking at this topic of detecting consciousness in the absence of responsiveness. I've shown you how using EEG, uh, we could, and, and anesthesia, we can potentially create a clinical tool that has the ability to predict whether an individual will recover consciousness or not. This has clinical implications for treatment and care decisions, but it also gives us some insight into the neural correlates of conscious experience in the brain itself. We've talked about technologies such as biomusic, which we can use to be able to develop interaction with individuals who are behaviorally unresponsive, but who are conscious. So in, the, in, in response to this question, well, now that we know that they're conscious, what do we do? Tools like this can potentially um, find their way into homes and care settings so that we can develop some sort of meaningful interaction with otherwise unresponsive individuals. And this ties into the work that my, my lab is doing on personhood to be able to augment and bolster this attribution of the status to some of the most vulnerable members of our society. So I'd like to close just by uh, acknowledging all of my incredible students. This is a subset of them, my, my, my postdocs, my grad students, who's uh, really, it's their work and their dedication that allows all of this, this great uh, research to be showcased to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That was really fascinating. Um, with the biomusic responses, I was interested to know um, how a body sounds when it sees like a, a sad or disturbing image or like alternatively a happy one. Is there like a generalized sound that you get for certain emotions? We customize the sound according to uh, the individual's musical preference. So I'm a classical musician. I, my body music, the way I like it to sound is like an orchestra. The, you know, the violins take the melody and we've got beautiful orchestration through the winds for the harmonies and, you know, nice percussion, beautiful articulation. That's my body music. But, um, you know, my, my seven-year-old son doesn't want to listen to this. He wants to listen to trains. And so we actually have a body music sonification where if you have a spike, in your sweat, you have a train whistle at woo woo, and then you have the heart rate driving the. Chuk -chuk 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 -chuk. So we design the sonifications so that they 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 are customized for the whoever is listening to the bio music. Wow, that's super cool. 
So like a family member could choose what they like for their person. And they have in past. So we've worked with individuals with dementia who have been, you know, previously been uh, jazz musicians and we've customized jazz sonifications for these individuals because the wife associated them with the saxophone, for example. I love the idea of a loved one personalizing it because they know that person best. And I just think that's really beautiful. Um, so I wanted to, to kind of carry on um, the topic of biomusic and um, ask you about the intersection of technology and how we understand consciousness and per personhood. And it seems like with fMRIs and biomusic apps, like it's really kind of just like the, the tip of the iceberg. And so I wanted to know, um, how do you see advances in tech technology like the biomusic app um, and settling current understandings of consciousness and personhood. One of the things that I, I see a lot of promise in is the ability for things like biomusic, like resonance to, in a way, to democratize uh, the ability to detect consciousness. Right now, it's a, it's a very specialized th uh, thing that requires fancy equipment, very advanced software, uh, people who have been trained for years to look at EEG signals. And, and I don't know, Heather, how much you got out of the graphs that I showed, but it took me years to be able to read these sorts of graphs. So it's very much concentrated into a set of, of experts. And what I see by music and resonance and technologies like this being able to do is allow individuals who haven't received five years of postdoctoral training to have access to these meaningful signals in the brain and in the body. And these are the individuals who are spending hours and days and weeks sitting by the bedside of someone who is unconscious. They are there holding their hand, singing their so singing songs, you know, talking to them. They are so attuned to every little change. And if you give them access to changes in the brain that are associated with consciousness in changes in the body that are associated with consciousness, they will quickly become the experts about if I do this, this sound changes. If I do that, this, this changes. I noticed something different today than I did yesterday. And it allows them to participate more fully in the conversations about whether these individuals are conscious or not, not just the engineers, not just the physicians. That's really fantastic. And that's really exciting. Um, so It'll be really wonderful to see what other kind of apps or technologies can really um, keep bringing people closer, uh, especially when um, you know they're maybe not not able to communicate, not able to talk. Yeah, I think you sort of like got into the answering this with your last answer for Heather. But how do you believe your research is improving the quality of life of your patients and their families? I would, I don't know if we're there yet. Bell is at a point where we are improving quality of life. I think our work is still fairly preliminary. Um, I would say that I'll, I'll give you my vision about how this work is able to Im improve quality of life. One of, the, one of the things that is the quickest to erode when you're unable to communicate is your relationships with other people because communication is so fundamental to being able to maintain and develop that, that particular relationship. And when you lose relationships, you lose your status of personhood um, to the point where you can actually be conscious but not have any personhood. Uh, you can actually have the converse as well. You can have personhood in some cultures and not, not be conscious. But one of the, the, the ways that I'm, I'm hoping that the work that we're doing is contributing to uh, improve quality of life is allowing, giving people the tools to maintain relationships with people who are unresponsive. So if I've been in a major accident and you don't know whether I'm conscious or not, knowing that you're coming in and being with me makes a difference that I notice that it makes a difference to you wanting to come. And if I'm in a long-term care setting and I'm unresponsive, being able to have some level of interaction with me and like you walk into the room and my music changes, even if I'm not telling you that I know that you're there, having some indication that you know that you're there, it changes the ability to form this relationship. And I think that that really is one of the major um, the 
definers of uh, an individual's quality of life, the quality of relationship that they're able to have with other individuals. And I think that this is where the technology is the most powerful. Yeah, that's really important. It's uh, really interesting that you're doing this. Um, I don't know, this might be like a little bit of left field of like what you've been talking about, but have you had like, people who wake up from a coma um, able to describe the feeling of being conscious without being able to respond to you? Like, is that something that people can sort of feel? There is a lot of anecdotal evidence and, and terrible stories actually that have come out of patients in coma in the ICU um, that sometimes go into like graphic detail about what it feels like to not be able to respond, but to be aware. Um, people are able to describe, you know, for example, there's there's um, uh, there was a story that I know of of a gentleman who was able to describe exactly the protocol that the nurse used in order to stimulate him to see whether he was conscious or not. And every nurse has a, you know, develop uh, over time, develops their own variation on, you know, their, their stimulation protocol. So it, it, it often involves inflicting pain, discomfort. So you, you, you're, tra you're trained to do a sternum rub, for example, but people come up with their own ways of doing this. And so this gentleman was able to describe the fact that he thought that he was in hell. He thought he was being tortured by the devil. And the way that the devil tortured him was he was able to, like, he pinched his armpit seven times, and then he took his, his neck and did this. And the nurse listening to this said, oh my God, that was me. I, and you weren't responding. Like I marked you as unconscious. Like that is my, you described step-by-step. Step. That was my protocol. That's my stimulation protocol. You didn't respond. And he said, yeah, I, I couldn't, but I know exactly what happened here. So it's, it's, you know, the source of a lot of, obviously a lot of distress, a lot of PTSD coming out of experiences like this, where you can't respond, even though you're aware, which is, you know, it, it's, it's another one of the reasons that it's so important to be able to detect whether someone is conscious and aware in these circumstances. Yeah, so for sure. That's quite upsetting. Sorry. No, sorry. Uh, so it seems like um, that these technologies and this 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 field it's important for the family members, but for many of the people who are um, who like that that person who you just mentioned, it's also important for them. It can be a way to to communicate when you know speaking isn't 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 possible for them, and so. Um, yeah, it's 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 like revolutionizing um, ways for people to communicate um, as like to to others to their family. So I just think it's really really fascinating how like, bio music apps can can redefine that and kind of give a sense of um, autonomy of agency to to people when uh, you know they they may seem like they're just unresponsive or you know unconscious. It's an interesting way of thinking about by music and resonance and these sorts of technologies. There are, one of the fields that I've worked in that I haven't, I didn't discuss in this lecture is the field of brain computer interfaces where you put EEG electrodes onto an individual and you have them control a computer with their thoughts. And this is really an individual intentionally creating changes in their brain activity in order to control a computer mouse or in order to type a letter. And this is the individual intentionally communicating. Biomusic and resonance are a little bit different. There's there's not an intention behind this. There's there, I mean, you can eventually learn to control your autonomic nervous system signals. For example, this is how people fool polygraphs, but uh, most people don't know how to do this. And, and what you're getting is a sonification of unintentional changes, just reactions to the environment and changes in your level of consciousness and level of awareness that are not directly intended for communication. And so the, the technology can be considered communicative, but less of um, being a, a voice for the patient and more of an ear for the caregiver. These changes exist regardless of whether the technology is on the patient or not. But what these, what we're giving the caregivers is the ability to hear these changes that already exist um, rather than giving the patient a, a different form of expression. To 
hear, I think the phrase you described, you use with symphony of the brain, um, giving them an ear to, to really hear that. Um, exactly. I really, I love that. That's, that's really like beautiful way of describing it. Um, so I, I had one more question, which is that I found your comments on the levels of consciousness quite interesting. I'd never seen like, I guess like it makes sense that when you're sleeping, you're at a lower level of consciousness, but I just never really thought about that before. So I was wondering if you had like a particular experience or a particular question which drew you towards studying minimally conscious or like low awareness people, or if it was just like the field that you found more interesting, like how did you head in that direction? I started my um, graduate studies uh, in a pediatric rehabilitation hospital and the research center was on the fourth floor. And on the third floor uh, were the inpatients and one wing of the inpatients was uh, children in complex continuing care. And uh, when I began my PhD, I started volunteering on that floor two nights a week. And I, I encountered a lot of kids who were unable to move, unable to speak. You really had no idea whether they were conscious or not. And so uh, it, was, it was really interesting to me interacting with them in the capacity of a volunteer as opposed to a researcher, because I would read to them, I would paint their nails, I would watch their parents interact with them. And for the first, I would say, couple of years, I really didn't see them, any signs of consciousness in, in them. They were, they were bodies in beds. And then I watched nurses interact with them. And I watched parents interact with them. I watched these beautiful therapeutic clowns interact with them. And slowly began to pick up on signs that their caregivers were seeing, the caregivers who had known them their whole lives were seeing and started after, you know, to be able to see what the caregivers saw, the tiny changes in muscle tension, tiny changes in their eyes when something was talked about. And you learned to see through the caregiver's eyes, you learned to see through the eyes of people who loved them these changes that indicated that they were responding to you. There was, there was a, a foundation for this relationship that, that was there. And I found that fascinating. I found the, that, you know, this, this years long training that, you know, I had informally embarked on. Um, I wanted to study that more. I wanted to know if we could accelerate this, being able to see into an individual's level of responsiveness and individual's level of consciousness. And I think that's what attracted me to, to this field. Thank you. Uh, if I could also ask uh, one more question uh, as well. Um, so I uh, wanted to know um, if you, uh, how you developed the head nets um, and if you needed a lot of prototyping, amelioration, um, because I noticed that they're in the background of your office. So I'm <laughs> There, those are very are, are new to me, so I would love to learn more about the actual um, the the, the technology. Use. So yes, <laughs> I can take I can take no credit for this. So this is this is a, a high density EEG system. It's just on a, on a like a very cheap mannequin. This is not cheap, uh, but this is 128 channels of EEG electrodes uh, that we use in the ICU and electrodes typically are um, gel based. So you put you put gel between the electrode and the skull in order to have a good conductance. What these are are sponge based electrodes. So instead of I'll show you right up there, these are all sponges that we soak in a mixture of baby shampoo and potassium chloride. And we soak them in the, this, this net in that for about 10 minutes. And we put this onto an individual. I can't really put it onto myself right now, but we put this onto someone's head. And because you've got this, this conductive um, material, you can get a good signal. You can set this up in about five or 10 minutes. It's sometimes a little bit more complicated with patients who are, um, whose skulls aren't intact, but the, uh, we can set this up in about five or 10 minutes in comparison to the an hour and a half sometimes, sometimes two hours that it takes to set up a gel-based EEG system. So these are fantastic for the ICU because you don't have two hours at the bedside. You have about half an hour to get in and get out because these patients are so unstable and so medically fragile. 
Thanks. Is that what you were wondering about these? Yeah, because they just looked, because uh, they, they look complicated, like so like just intricate. And I know that in, uh, you had pictures of, of your students wearing them. And so I was like, oh, I just, I want to want to hear more about, uh, about that. Thank you, Dr. Blay Morais. I, I also was intrigued about those hair nets. Is, is that your, is that the most favorite technology you've ever developed in, in your whole your whole career as a researcher in this field, or or could you share with us? My the favorite technology that I've developed. Well, I, like I said, I can't take any credit for. I'm I certainly didn't develop the EEG. I purchased the EEG system. I really do like the EEGs, um, and in particular these EEGs because I'm I am drawn to technologies that have immediate translational potential in the clinic. I, I, we learn a lot through of, about the brain and about consciousness through techniques like fMRI, like functional magnetic resonance imaging, but it's very difficult to get patients and disorders of consciousness down into the magnets for, for many, many reasons. And this technology allows us, my research team to go right up to the bedside, even when patients have shunts in their brain, many of our patients have swollen brains. And so they have half of their skulls removed in order to relieve the pressure on the brain. They have um, pressure monitors inside the brain. There's, it's a very complicated thing that's happening around their head. And these nets allow us to access the brain activity in spite of all of this. So I'm partial to this, Ingrid. <laughs> well, I learned a lot. I know Isabel and um, Heather did as well. This was such a wonderful sharing of your work and and how how much you care about about these people, not just the technology, not just what you're what you're getting scientifically out of your work. So thank you very, very much. Officially, we gift our speakers. You will be getting in the mail the official um, McGill University outreach face mask. And I'll also slip in some of the filters so that you can use those um, filters for it. From the Red Path Museum, you'll be getting um, this gallery guide. It's called The Fossil's Tale. So even though the museum is closed, you will be able to enjoy the history of life, reading about the exhibits, the fossils, the animals, the ancient and modern animals that have lived around, well, they're global actually. Um, I hope you can enjoy that with your colleagues or your family. The bookmark that comes with that is made from a letter that Darwin signed and sent to the museum's founder in 1871. Darwin Day is this Saturday. It's February 12th. It is marks his birthday, the date of his birth, and um, natural history museums tend to have a, a ritualized acknowledgement of that. Uh, Darwin Day is very important for us because it's in everything we do. And finally, just for fun, I hope your three kids and you can enjoy the stereoscopic postcard. You'll take off the outer wrapping and you'll put it, you know, it'll expand its bit of a, a pop-up pop thing and as you look through it, you'll have a stereoscopic view of that wonderful Gorgosaurus libratus. I know he's super shiny there. There you go. That's the Dawson Gallery at the Red Path Museum. Incredible. Thank you so much, Ingrid. It's, those are just lovely. And I'm sure that I, I, I will enjoy them, but I think that my three kids are actually going to enjoy them more than I will. We will be back here in a month's time, March 10th. Same time, 6 p.m. McGill YouTube channel. Our speaker is Sarah Moser from the Department of Geography at McGill University. And she's an urban geographer. She has for a long time been very, very interested to understand these mega developments, these huge um, created subdivisions, massive, massive modern cities being um, built in the Gulf states. And she now sees them as a way of combating religious fundamentalism. Um, and she'll tell us why. Hope to see you all back here March 10th in about a month's time. Bye, everyone.